This is Cruise Radio. I cruise a lot and I always sail with travel insurance. You should too. Get a free quote today at tripinsurance.com. Here we go. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Cruise Radio. Frederick just returned from a 10 night cruise aboard the brand new and freshly christened Norwegian Viva. This one went from Rome to Lisbon. It was a 10 night sailing, very port intensive too. And he joins us on the line to talk all about the new ship and the ports of call. How you doing, my friend? Good to talk to you again. I'm doing awesome. And we have such a great cruise. So I'm, I'm super psyched to talk about it. Very cool. Well, let's jump right into it then. So as we always do, we'll get some pre-cruise thoughts before we walk on board the ship. What made you want to do this 10-nighter from Rome to Lisbon? Well, we did Prima a year ago, and we were so impressed by the ship. I know I ended the interview with saying that I probably wouldn't go back to mm-hmm. sail. Of course, that was not true because we booked a couple of NCL since then, and we were just off getaway a couple of, of uh, weeks ago. And we wanted to try uh, the new Viva because we loved Prima so much and I uh, thought, is it different? It's going to be the same. So we were curious to say the least. And also we had the opportunity to bring some friends with us. So we traveled as two couples. So the four of us, we just hit it. Very good. Now you're up in Sweden. You had to get down to Rome. How long is that flight going from Sweden down to Rome? I'm not sure if I can tell you. It's so short. It's just, it's a matter of hours really. And it's, it's direct flights. It's very easy. But we always fly in the day before because, mm. I mean, Chivitaveke is not the most exciting place to stay, but it's really close to, to where the ship is. And you really want to wake up in the morning, just see the ship and just be excited for the new day. So we actually flew in the night before. We stayed in Chivitaveke and we just head out as soon as possible with a I think we had the first embarkation time at, or the second time at 9.30, mm-hmm. which was really early. I'm curious because there's so many different ways to get down to the cruise port. When you fly into Rome, what method do you use to get down to Chivacivacchia? I would just Uber because it's easier. And mm-hmm. since we were four of us, it's, it's kind of cost efficient. We did also do not do any check luggage on this trip, which is nice. something new for us. I mean, we've had, we've done a couple a couple of cruises, I think it's the 104th or 105th cruise, and we've always done checked luggage, but with with a feel free at NCL, it feels really good to just have your carry-ons with you. And then I guess the train could be, be an option, but if mm. you want to change that, and it's going to be difficult whether you have to, if you have a lot of checked luggage. So yeah. I would just go for Uber as well. So you go to board Norwegian Viva down there. How was the embarkation process? And does does Chivacivacchia, does it actually have a like a cruise terminal like we're used to seeing the, the big ones, kind of like uh, maybe like Southampton has and all that? Or is it more uh, of an industrial terminal? It is very industrial, but they do have terminals for for some of the cruise ships. I think we had four or five um, embarkating at the same time. And we were in the tent version. So we had the somewhat open tent, but it was kind of okay because the uh, the check-in time was probably less than 15 minutes. We just walked in. We had the first check-in time. We were on board the ship in 15 minutes. Gosh, you can't beat that. So I know you were just on Prima yeah. last year, but uh, how, what were your first impressions this go around? And like, was there anything, um, I haven't sailed, uh, I haven't sailed Prima, only Viva. So was there anything you noticed that actually was maybe a little bit different as you walked on board from one ship to the other? I was uh, equally blown away as I was with uh, with Prima. It is, I mean, it's basically the same ship. Yeah. The, the differences and the nuances are so small. I mean, Yes, they on Prima, you have two Starbucks. On this one, you have one because they took away the Starbucks and indulge and put in more seating. I think that's one of the only things that people would notice gotcha. or if they sell them both of them. But there's some decor elements, but pretty much it is the same ship. I okay. think yeah. You make your way to your stateroom and uh, like you boarded early. You said you were in one of the first boarding groups. Was the stateroom ready for you right when you got on board? No, it wasn't. And that, that took some time, really, because with the, the changeover, we're just having a fewer stateroom attendants than ever. Uh, I think we were on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. So that was a kind of a, a long wait. But it was very easy because our carry-ons could be stored at the casino so they had a specific place where we where we dropped off all the luggage and we just walked away and that was that was really that was really neat. I liked that version. So you finally make your way to your stateroom though. Uh, I'm still very impressed. You did ten nights with just a carry on. That's really cool. So what kind of stateroom yeah. did you, what kind of stateroom did you book for this ten night cruise and how was it throughout the voyage? So we had a balcony stateroom and our friends they had an inside stateroom. So we got to compare both of them. I think the staterooms on Prima Viva are really good. I'm especially blown away with the bathroom. 
because it is so large, they have really uh, maximized the space for, for that facility as well. The balcony has an adequate size and uh, the bed is raised for your, I mean, our carry-ons could fit anywhere, but if you have large luggage, you just put them under, that's no problem. It has uh, some really nice amenities as well. So the, the state room gives, a, I will probably give them a five plus on, on that side. And they also had USB-C plugs in there as well, correct? Absolutely. And by the bed, you just plug it in. It's perfect. Yeah, you can't beat that. A lot of cruise lines could learn from them. So let's talk about the food on this 10-night cruise. We'll start at the Surfside Cafe, which is the buffet. What did you think of it? Uh, equally small as it is on the first ship. It is inadequate. And we we barely spent any time up there because, of course, there's Indulge. A lot of people didn't find out about Indulge until a couple of days into the cruise. So we just had it straight to Indulge. We had some drinks and we just settled in for lunch when, when they opened. So the buffet on the, this class of ship is very small because it's basically like half the size of a normal buffet because it only, I believe it's only on the port side because the starboard side is part of, a, I guess, part of two specialty restaurants on these ships. But the Indulge, though, talk to us about that, because, I mean, it was also one of my favorite places. I was in there almost every day for lunch grabbing barbecue or some kind of Asian dish. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, just walk in, find a table. You will have your iPad. There's pictures. That's easy as well. You can sort of look at what you're going to have. How I mean, the portion size and everything. You just punch in and they will get it to you at the table. So you don't have to walk around trying to figure out what you want. So if you want some tapas, you want to complement that, of course you will, with some, some Indian food, then just go ahead. Or you just make a meal out of it and just press every single button there is, I guess, and just yeah. have food for days. You can just pick and choose. And um, we did also a couple of nights we went in because it's a different lunch menu than dinner menu. Um, and especially for the, um, because we love Indian food, there is a completely different menu for, for dinner. So we went on like an early early pre-dinner thing that mm-hmm. we started out at five, just get some nons and just get some, some, some something with our drinks. And then we went to regular dinner later at eight. So I would recommend them for dinner as well because it's, it's so tasty. It's so freshly prepared. It's really, really a nice place, especially if you can sit outside. I and mean, we just bring your food with you, sit outside, have some drinks and just enjoy. Yeah, no, certainly. Did you dine in? They don't call it a main dining room, but it's basically a main dining room there on the back of the ship uh, throughout your cruise. Yes, we did because we had, uh, let's see, we had four nights in specialty. So we basically did six nights at Hudson. And on the first uh, uh, cruise when we did Prima, it was the same set menu every night. But of course, they have changed that to the rotating menu, which which is, is it's good and bad because, okay, of course, you know exactly where you're going to get where the, uh, the, the set menu, but now you get more variety as well. Uh, Hudson is absolutely spectacular. The, the views, the scenery, the service, the people. I mean, Hudson is such a nice place on many cruise ships. This would be a specialty restaurant. So you mentioned you had a specialty free at sea package there. So you had four of them for this crew. So talk to us about the restaurants you went to and give us a highlight from each one. So we started off with Cagney's, uh, the classic steakhouse. That was okay. It's not my favorite. It wasn't my favorite on Prima either. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, people talk a lot about food quality going down and the meat. My, my meat was pretty deep tough. It wasn't something I was super excited about. But I mean, it's a nice place. That it, 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 it's okay. Our favorite restaurant is Le Bistro. And we did Le Bistro on the birthday that followed because we celebrated our birthday on this cruise. And it was spectacular. The service, the food, the ambiance, the endless free-flowing Veuve of course, one of the reasons why we <laughs> failed. The champagne is really nice, and and wow, the the meal was just spectacular. I really really liked it. Yeah, beautiful dining room there too at Le Bistro. Cagney's, though, I agree with you. I, I wasn't impressed at all with the the cut of meat, and if I if I didn't have the dining package, I would have been very disappointed paying those a la carte prices. I'm agreeing, and and also since we I, spoiler alert, we we booked another cruise on NCL, mm-hmm. and we're just talking about that. We're probably not going to do Cagney's on the next one. We're going to do different ones, or coming back to the ones we really like. After the Bistro, we did Onda, which is such a nice space to be sitting in. I mean, the the ambiance, the food was really good. We had plenty. Also, when you're four or more, it's easier to share food because it's more like a sharing experience. So we got to taste more of the menu than we're just two of us. Uh, I think the surprise hit was the last night where we did the uh, last night of the sailing we did Los Lobos because we were sitting outside. It was a really warm, nice evening. 
it would just have the table side guacamole and I was really surprised about the, the, the food there because we didn't we didn't have the opportunity to go on prima so Los Lobos is some fair some place we're going to go back to I'm sure on the next week any other food places you may have hit up during the the sailing we haven't talked about yet? Um, I'm trying to think like if there were any kind of grab and grow uh, grab and go places around there or any uh, or like the local maybe. Local, yes, we did local. I think we did local both for for breakfast and lunch. Um, usually, we did have breakfast in the main dining room, which is or Hudson, which is a really nice place to enjoy a leisurely breakfast. But uh, local is open 24 seven, so there is a rotating like breakfast, lunch, and dinner menu. So you can always go to local for some snacks. And we did we did take advantage of that as well. How was the service like in the specialty restaurants in the main dining room as far as like the speed and, you you know, like once you're seated, someone comes to you pretty quickly? I think the service was really good. I think the only time we had some service issues were bar service. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if they were short staffed or it, it just felt like you were waiting for drinks way longer than you should have. And that was across the board. Yeah. And um, again, sailing in November, and there's a lot of things going around. I'm suspecting that could be could be something that they were they were just short because people were sick on board or something mm -hmm. like that. Could gotcha. be. Now I'm going to ask you this next question, uh, knowing that this was a cruise with no sea days, and these European ports are very very busy and a lot of walking and stuff. But did you get to experience much of the evening entertainment um, as far as well the the theater? Um, I guess they have the I have Beetlejuice on there, which if you tell me you saw that, I'm going to be super jealous because it wasn't ready when I was on there or anything around the ship. We got to experience everything because, again, we've been to all the ports so many times before. So actually, a couple of the days, we tried to make them see days just to get mm -hmm. some more relaxation in. But we did to get to see Beetlejuice. Nice. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, it was it was they were really good. It was really talented cast. And they also performed icons. So they had two like bigger production shows in the theater as well. So um, you have to, I'm sorry, you have to book and, and, and sail another time with them as well because they, it was really good. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure about the, the game show, press, press Your Luck. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't really stoked about that one. I think the one on Prima, was, Price is Right, was so much better. Uh, Sid Normans had moved out of, uh, of, of that, that house a bit because they did prom in the theater as well, which was really amazing how they staged that. So the, the prom was, was performed in the theater. I think one of the, the more um, we were more excited about was Mr. Fagan's Speak Easy at Sid Norman. Mm -hmm. So one of the poor performers, he, he put on a, his own show for one evening, and it was so good. We were so excited to see that, and, and, and it did not disappoint. So there was quite a few highlights, and I think the entertainment was ramped up quite a bit from our prima experience. I don't think we were expecting so much on Prima because we hadn't been on NCL for such a long time. But mm -hmm. then we did, after Prima, we did Getaway and it was just entertainment overload everywhere. Yeah. So comparing Prima and Getaway and um, Prima was a little bit light a year ago. I think they ramped up some of the entertainment for Viva. There was a lot more things happening at, at, at more times of the day. And also you didn't have to pre-book so much. It was just Beetlejuice and icons. Everything else was walk-in. So that was nice. A comedy was performed in the theater instead of the really, really small improv space that they have. So they sort of branched out to different spaces. And it, it was more music. It was more entertainment. It was a lot more evening fun that I expected on the European cruise. Do they do multiple nights of Beetlejuice? Yes. Yeah, I think it's performed four times. So it's for two nights. It's an early or, or late show. So And the show is 90 minutes. So it's the Las Vegas version. They cut out some some of the songs, I guess. I haven't seen it on Broadway. I'm not sure if it is with an admission or if it's uh, just one show. Yeah, it was about have, two have hours. You seen it on Broadway? Yeah, it's about two hours on Broadway with uh, intermission in the middle of it. Okay. So yes. this is the 90 minute version. So. Yeah, they, I, I'm not sure what they cut out, but it, it was fun to watch. Nice. All right. So any time in the casino? Uh, just passing through. Uh, and uh, again, it, it's really nice to pass through because no one is smoking. They have a special small smoke se section, but everything else is smoke free. So you can just walk in, walk out, and there's no smoke whatsoever. The casino is basically like right off of the, the main shops, right there off the atrium, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. So smoking there would be a problem for a lot of people. So I think they've, they've handled that really well. And on one side, it has a smoking section, and 
and also the high rollers room, which I, I suspect is it's smoking as well. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not a high roller. So right. Who knows? <laughs> now, I, this is where I would ask you, how were the sea days? But since you didn't have any, I'll ask you just how was the ship overall on the 10 days? Um, since we didn't spend so much time up in the buffet, I mean, we just passed once where it was, I, I mean, it was really crowded. We didn't grab anything. We're just passing through it. It was, it was a madhouse. Uh, but apart from that, the ship really disperses people in a really nice way. And we were sailing at a hundred and something. We didn't have any kids on board. So it was just about a hundred percent, 102 or something like that. So it wasn't, it didn't feel that crowded. And also sunshine, people were outside taking advantage of the, uh, the amazing uh, waterfront thing that they have on deck eight, where you can walk around the entire ship and be outside. So you don't have to be on top deck. You don't have to be close to the buffet. You can be somewhere else. I think people took advantage of that and, and, sort of dispersed in their own way. So it was it was really nice. And again, in the port days, it was empty. I mean, we stayed on board for, for some, some time, and it was the, as soon as the, the ship docked and everyone went on their tour, it was just empty. Did you do the go-kart track? Of course. It is the best <laughs> part on board. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of sad we want to go on Aqua because it looks like an amazing ship, but I really miss the go-kart because we had so much since we were four of us, we were racing and mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it was an adrenaline rush to, to say the least, because of course you want to overtake everyone. What are they charging now on my sailing? I believe it was 15 per session. Is it still about the same? It's still about the same. Okay. Very good. Yeah. You're talking it's an eight, eight minutes uh, thing or something. Yeah. I think he said eight minutes. So it, it felt like it was sufficient. I mean, it could be longer, but eight minutes is still, it's, it's still a lot for your money, I think. It felt longer to me because I got throttled trying to pass some friends right out of the gate. So I was like going half <laughs> speed for the whole eight minutes while my friends were lapping me. I was dead last on the board. <laughs> okay. Well, that's yeah. one way to do it. Yeah. Uh, you can also take, you can also do the, uh, have the entire, um, for yourself. So you could, you could pay extra. And then I think it's the same amount, five, $15, but you get three minutes. And then you're the only one on the track. And they also increase the speed as well. So you, oh, can, nice. you can go faster on that one. Yeah. That, so that's, that's a, a tip for next thing. Yeah, I know. Certainly, for sure. And you were talking about the pool. Now, Norwegian certainly isn't known for their big pool deck areas. But like you said, uh, down there on deck eight, they have that infinity space, which is very nice with those pools down there. So you can very much so spread out, whether you're next to the pool, you're up on that level where the kids' little waterfall area is, or you're down there on eight. It doesn't seem like everyone's just congested at the main pool area. I think I think it's really nice. And I I mean, there are some other cruise lines that are sort of copying this concept as well and mm -hmm. trying to, to, to make it. But I think Ansel has done a really good good job. And I think on Aqua, they've expanded it even more for the next ship. So it's going to be even... Yeah, even more fun on decades. So I'm yeah. looking forward to them. Yeah, it definitely works for them. So let's talk about the ports of call. You mentioned you stayed on board for a couple of them. So what we'll do here is give us the port of call, give us a highlight, and we'll just go to the next one. Okay, first stop was Livorno, and we just walk around town. Livorno is the gateway to Tuscany. So I'm just going to say, well, if you haven't been there before, of course, go to Florence. I would skip Pisa. If you, I mean, it's the Leaning Tower at least. Yeah, there's nothing more about that. So <laughs> go, to, go to Florence instead. So our second stop was Suisse Franche, and that's a, the only tender port. And tender operations worked so well on the ship as well, because they had big tenders that came and, 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 and picked us up. And Suisse Franche is the gateway to Monaco and Nice. And it's so easy to go to both Monaco and Nice, because it, you're dropped off right by the train station. And Nice is less than 10 minutes. Monaco is probably 15. It's very easy to go to these ports. Um, Again, we stayed in Villefranche because we met up with some some friends uh, from North Carolina that flew over, and <laughs> coincidentally, we we had lunch together in Villefranche. It wasn't really planned that way, but it, it happened that way. And the next day was Marseille, and Marseille is France's second largest city, and it's one of the more boring places you will find in the Met if you stay in the city itself. Most people don't. Most people do what we did: uh, take an Uber or transportation to Aix-en-Provence. To get up in the Provence area, where we had a rave, uh, sorry, we had arranged a private chef experience. So um, we had a chef that picked us up downtown, or downtown. It was it's still X, so it's a small village, and we we cooked for four hours and had a three course meal with some wine. So nice. that that was an amazing experience actually in in Marseille. Uh, Barcelona, uh, if you've never been, you should definitely stay in the city and experience everything from Sagrada Familia and to, to Gaudi and all the exciting things. 
Uh, we went up into wine country in Penendez and uh, had some great wine. I would recommend that. Ibiza is the party capital of Europe. Uh, again, we just walked around. There's nothing really much to see in Ibiza if you're not there late at night and you want to experience the clubs. I mean, you could go to the beach, but again, it's a very small place. Palma de Mallorca, uh, we're there on a Sunday, which is also difficult in Europe if you end up on a Sunday, and especially if you're there from 6 a.m. until 1, which is one of the more stranger times we've been, been in any place because you sort of get off the ship and then you have to go back on it again. The Palma is a really nice city and so much to do from you have the caves, you have the, the city itself and the cathedral, just walk around really good. Next up was Gibraltar, and Gibraltar, of course, famous for the monkeys up on top of the mountain. They have also some caves, and we had some tapas, so we enjoyed the tapas there. Malaga was the uh, next stop, and I guess a lot of people go to Alhambra Palace, which is uh, really spectacular up in the countryside. Again, we stayed in Malaga and just walked around and, and had some coffee. Uh, and last and final port was Cadiz, and Cadiz is, of course, gateway to Seville. So if you haven't been, you want to go to Seville or to Jerez de Frontera, which is uh, also a nice place. Um, but we went on a cheese-making tour with the ship, so we were on a bus for an hour and a half to make some cheese and then the bus back again. It was a nice tour. Probably not going to do that one again, so I wouldn't highly recommend that one, but Staying on board, uh, so far, staying in the city itself, like our friends did, uh, would have been a better option. So that was a very quick rundown of all the ports we went to. When you went to Cadiz, did you see any ships in the shipyard there? Yes, we did. Um, I can't remember which ones were there, actually, but we saw a couple on the, on, because on the bus on the way to our, our cheese making. Nice. Uh, but there were, uh, there were a couple, I think Sea Dream was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Sea Dream Yachts were there and some others. So they... It, it, it is a very big port. Um, it was very easy to get off the ship as well. The only thing that was a, a, a strike, there's always something. So there was a pilot strike. So that delayed the um, departure. Uh, but we were fortunate to get off very early. Uh, we had flights out the same day. So uh, I think there, I imagine there would be some, some problems with all the people uh, departing the ship at the same time. But I, I think it was fairly okay. Lisbon's one of those cities, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're going to spend a little time there after the cruise, it's, it's a very walkable city, and you're basically almost in downtown where the ship docks. Absolutely. And again, I, I would recommend walking around, or I would recommend Ubering. Um, we, um, it's really strange because we always Uber or Lyft, but this time we went to the taxi stand, and I had checked on Uber and said... Um, 10 euros to get to the airport because the airport is really close. And we jumped into the cab and there was no meter running. And I asked him, he's like, there is no meter. And he said, well, I have this app. And I'm thinking, okay, let's, let's go for it. Uh, and then I realized that he is really trying to scam us. And uh, he did. When we came to the airport, he said, well, it's 39. And I said, that's not really true. And he said, well, it's because I say so. And I said, I'm sorry, because I just checked and it's 10. And then, uh, I said, Let, well, let's let's call the police or get someone here. And then he said, no, it's for free. You can you can travel for free. Oh, and I was like, wouldn't you rather have 10 euros and just, yeah. just walk away from this? And he said, yeah, I'll have that. So my advice would be, and I'm not sure if this is specific for Lisbon or anything, I would go with uh, over the app solutions because it is so much easier to have that conversation with, with that company instead of that person itself. I've never been ripped off by a taxi driver before, but it was... It's not 40 euros to get from Lisbon to the airport. It is more like 10 euros. I was going to say. It's a very short trip. Yeah, uh, I was there in the summertime. I think I was, uh, I debarked uh, in June there. And it was like an eight minute ride, I think, from the cruise port to the airport. And uh, yeah, it was like maybe 15 with a tip. Yeah, yeah. that's probably right. It's not 40. Yeah, yeah. No. But I, I mean, I expect a lot of people's like, yeah, 40, that wasn't so bad. I mean, let's pay him and go. I'm just like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> That did not take away from this amazing cruise anyway. So yeah. I'm just I'm just telling people to be careful when they jump into cabs to ask before. If there's no meter running, like, are we doing meters? Is it, is it a set price or what's happening here? Yep, no. Just have, having those questions ready is good. 100%. So you get off the ship, you're off the, the voyage, you're back home now. Any first-time tips to offer anyone sailing Norwegian Viva? 
Well, just realizing the ship is different than all the other NCL ships or, or ship classes. So if you've been on the other ships, just study the deck plans and, and make sure you know what 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 it is. Um, one thing is it's really difficult to find restrooms on board because they always seem to be in places where you don't, don't expect them to be, and they sort of uh, it feels like they're <laughs> they're moving around them uh, different floors. Uh, I would go straight to indulge and try to exp- experience that as early as possible in the uh, in the cruise. And also pre-book. Um, and the last tip is probably to go straight to show and dinner reservations when getting on board because they have a really nice setup. We can do all the reservations. So if you haven't pre-booked, do that first. I guess most people go to, to the bar and have a drink. Don't do that. Go and make make all those reservations. Then you can go on your on your on your vacation. If you pre-book, do you have to pay when you pre-book or do you still get charged on board? If you have the free at sea package and you already paid for the dinner, you don't, I mean, it's, it is deducted at the t- time where you're at the, at the place itself. Gotcha. And again, the same, it doesn't cost anything. So there's no, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't pre-book anything. So yeah. just pre-book everything you have. Looking back, what was the biggest highlight of this cruise for you? I think cruising with friends. I mean, we've done that in the past. Usually it is just the two of us, but cruising, cruising with a group of people and, and seeing the cruise from, from their perspective is, is so is so amazing, and they really liked it. And also celebrating birthdays on board. I mean, every time you can celebrate something is good, but on a cruise ship, it's even better. And I mean, the service, the attention, people just like it. So I, 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 would, I would definitely go on, on more birthday cruises in the future. Absolutely. And final thoughts of Norwegian Viva. I just can't wait for Aqua. I mean, I think NCL has a winner. Our next ship is going to be uh, Escape, but we're going to do a lot more NCL cruises in, in the future. But I think this, this ship is amazing. I think everyone should try and have an open mind and, and just uh, just enjoy themselves. We've been talking with Frederick about his 10-night sailing aboard Norwegian Viva from Rome to Lisbon. As always, good talking to you, my friend. And uh, come back on when you sail again. Oh, I will. Have a great one. Thank you. Just back from a cruise? Let's talk about it. Email Doug at cruiseradio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker from my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out TripInsurance.com. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy. Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money-saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five-star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at cruiseradio.net. I'm your announcer.